in admitting people now. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started in just a moment. How are you? You too. We're going to get started in one moment. Please bear with us.
All right, I'm going to go ahead and kick us off and we'll have others join us as we begin here. I want to welcome everyone to our recovery exchange uh, meeting. This is an opportunity for SAMHSA and our Office of Recovery to interact with the recovery community and allies across the nation to share our updates in terms of uh, work um, at the federal level to advance recovery across the nation, as well as to hear from you uh, about um, work that you're doing at the state and local levels and, and other activities that you believe are in fact important. We have a full agenda here um, this afternoon um, and that it does include um, uh, some quick updates on the Office of Recovery. We'll hear from our Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Tom Coderre. We'll hear about uh, recent work in recovery housing, recovery month, uh, our uh, online presence, and then a little bit more detail about work that we're doing around measurement and data as this relates to recovery. Um, so as we uh, start on the next slide, this is just our standard disclaimer here, folks, uh, that uh, uh, this presentation um, in, the, in the public domain again, um, but uh, we welcome everyone to this particular gathering. So Office of Recovery on the next slide, if we may, in September celebrated our one year anniversary and our first year was uh, quite a busy one to say the least. And so this in this slide is just a sample of the many accomplishments and activities of the Office of Recovery in our first year. Um, and we'll be hearing again about uh, a few of these in more detail, um, but um, we're excited now um, going into our second year and the activities ahead. Um, if you go um, to the chat, we're going to include a link to a recent blog post that I developed that provides a lot more detail about the Office of Recovery and our very many uh, activities and accomplishments during year one. I also want to acknowledge that the Office of Recovery is growing. And so um, with us today, I want to do a particular shout out to our newest member of the Office of Recovery, Katera Aslami Tamplin, and she's waving here. Welcome to Katera, a uh, longtime uh, recovery leader from the state of California. We're really excited to have Katera join our team. I also want to note that uh, we have a job announcement on the street right now, and we're going to put that posting also into the chat here. And we encourage you to take a look at that job announcement and share it among your many colleagues as well. I'll note it is a quick turnaround and the deadline to apply for uh, these vacancies within the Office of Recovery is December the 11th. So please take a look at that um, as we continue to grow the Office of Recovery. At this point, it's my honor to introduce our Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Tom Coderre, longtime recovery champion, and um, really our leader and helped to establish the Office of Recovery. Tom, please. Well, uh, thank you so much, Paolo, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to see so many friends online, and I'm reading in the chat here as you guys are introducing yourselves. Uh, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. We have 200 people on the line. Uh, whoever thought we would get uh, this kind of interest in uh, this meeting. Uh, this is our third recovery exchange meeting convened by the Office of Recovery. And uh, I should really start by uh, thanking all of you for the work you do every day uh, to help people on their journeys of recovery. Um, these recovery exchange meetings, they've been really critical uh, to SAMHSA. And especially as we've just started uh, this office, Paulo just described the office as being uh, just celebrating its first year uh, in existence. So um, we've need, needed help to identify what the office goals should be, uh, what the national recovery agenda should look like, what the work product uh, that you guys in the field are looking for from SAMHSA. Uh, it's important for us to share our work on recovery as well, uh, to listen and to hear from you so we can keep our focus 
on advancing recovery across the nation, because that's our goal. Uh, SAMHSA acknowledges that recovery is a reality for millions of Americans, people just like me, uh, and like so many of you on the call today. Um, in fact, it can be the expectation uh, for people today who experience behavioral health conditions, because we have more resources and tools than we ever have had before. Uh, recovery is also a cross-cutting and cross-agency principle uh, at SAMHSA. So we have real momentum uh, across the agency. The office has been able to be involved uh, in our all of our planning documents, uh, creating notice of funding opportunities, creating contracts uh, throughout the agency, reviewing documents, um, really having a say uh, in making sure that recovery is represented in everything that we do. Um, we also want to thank you guys for continuing to show up and speak out in these meetings because uh, as you do, and, and we've noticed in the past couple of meetings uh, that people really have brought um, brought some excellent points to the forefront, uh, some that have been fairly controversial, and that's okay because um, that has really helped us uh, to develop this agenda and to understand uh, what the uh, different opinions are um, in, the, in the community um, that we really need to grapple with. Uh, when we talk about there being millions of people in recovery, uh, we now have data to back that up. Recently, SAMHSA released uh, our 22, 2022 National Survey on Drug Use and Health report. The report shows how people living in this country reported about their experiences with mental health, substance use, and treatment-related behaviors in 2022. The data, what does it look like? Um, well, 2022 saw a similar number of adults as 2021 with a past substance use problem or mental health condition that now identify as being in recovery. And it was just a percentage point or two difference. And we saw a slight increase in the total number of people in recovery, 21.3 uh, million uh, in 2022 versus the 20.9 million last year. Um, that was for uh, substance use disorders, and 40.8 million in 2022 versus the 38.8 million uh, that we saw last year for mental health. And I assume um, this is due to more people identifying uh, as meeting the DSM criteria. Uh, and you're going to hear more from uh, Grace Lee. Uh, we actually have a statistician in the Office of Recovery now, uh, not only to help us uh, get this data, but then to start to uh, be able to figure out what it means and what we should do with it. But the bottom line really is, is that we know we have much more work to do to achieve the promise of recovery for all. Uh, that's why we established the Office of Recovery at SAMHSA, and that's why we staffed it with people uh, with lived experience to intentionally focus uh, on the full continuum. I've often said that if you're not investing in recovery support, either post, alongside, or in place of treatment, then you're missing um, the critical lesson this chronic condition has taught us. We really hope that the Office of Recovery can help many more people find their way uh, and live full, happy, independent lives in their communities with their families and friends. We expect no less. Again, uh, thanks everybody for all you do uh, for your own families, in your local communities, in your states, and across the nation. Uh, to help save lives and help people thrive in recovery. I really look forward uh, to this meeting today, hearing from you together as we advance recovery across America. Have a wonderful holiday season and a great meeting today. Back to you, Paulo. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you for all your leadership. Um, next up, we're going to hear from our Officer Recovery Special Expert, Donna Dimitrovic, about recovery housing. Donna. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here to provide some background on the release of our best practices for recovery housing report. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Donna Dimitrovic, and I have the honor and the privilege to serve as a senior advisor here in the Office of Recovery. So um, next slide, please. I just wanted to give a little bit of a background um, on uh, the Omnibus Excellence in Recovery Housing language, and part of that um, was to develop new guidelines for best practices for recovery housing, uh, providing grants to states to implement guidelines, creating interagency working group, 
to coordinate work on recovery housing, and then the commission to study and review availability and quality of recovery housing. And really, um, uh, the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use, Dr. Delphin Rittman, uh, who is acting on behalf of HHS, is really required to lead these efforts. And the Office of Recovery has been working uh, with our leadership to really promote quality recovery housing. Next slide, please. So we know that recovery housing is an intervention that's considered a recovery support service, specifically designed to address the recovering person's need for a safe and healthy living environment, while also having the ability to provide peer and recovery supports if needed. It is to ensure that recovery housing facilities adhere to and promote the use of evidence-based practices, and the report, um, as I offer some details on the report, it really provides an overarching framework to improve and extend foundational policy and practice for recovery housing. Next slide. So these are the 11 best practices that we've identified uh, in the recovery housing report. Uh, it was developed with assistance from our stakeholders. Um, I'll quickly review these best practices, but really would encourage all of you to download from our website to get further information on these. So recovery housing uh, um, embraces, should embrace SAMHSA's recovery definition, which of course includes the dimensions of health, home, purpose, and community, um, really to promote person-centered, individualized, and strength-based approaches which includes an opportunity for the Recovery House uh, program to assist individuals with, it, with their mental health, medical, occupational, maybe family, legal, and other social needs. So really um, looking at it from a person-centered approach and being able to provide us uh, that strength-based approach as well. Uh, we know that uh, Recovery Houses could have uh, people at many different um, kind of levels in their recovery, or I, I consider it like a lifespan of recovery, right? So there could be people new in recovery in the recovery house or somebody that has many years. And so being able to uh, kind of meet people where they're at and provide them with the a, with a support that they need um, and understanding that they may need, um, you know, something different in early recovery than they do uh, later on in recovery. Um, you know, things to consider. Uh, that we put in this report when determining appropriate settings for people may include, you know, the culture of the house, uh, level of support that's provided, the geographic area, living environment, uh, current residents, um, you know, staff training and professionalism for higher levels, uh, maybe ethics, rights protection. So there's a, there's a, a, a slew of things that are um, in, incorporated into this report for folks to take a look at when considering recovery housing. Um, it's also important really to understand and ensure that people understand policies and procedures within the structure of the recovery house, especially those that are new in recovery. Understand what, um, what um, uh, policies um, are, are required, or not required, but are, are asked of residents when they move into the house. So ensuring that people understand that is really important. Um, the best practices that report also incorporates really the principles of the social model of recovery. So, you know, having a community experience that is nurturing, safe, unconditional building trust, and really is grounded in kindness. Uh, the recovery housing uh, best practices also talks about equity being promoted and that operators should be responsive and respective of other people's needs. A strong sense of community and cultural competent living environment really helps to support a resident's restoration of healthy relationships. Um, of course, you know, it, within this recovery housing best practices report, we talk about safety of residents. Uh, making sure that quality and integrity and uh, the rejection of patient brokering. Um, we know that if patient brokering happens, it really does um, uh, have like a uh, an effect which, you know, these unethical practices can have an effect that that 
uh, kind of moves out into the community. So, you know, there, there could be some uh, not in my backyard, nimbyism attitudes as a result of that, of any unethical approaches, you know, monetary consequences, uh, increase in rates. So there's some of the things that we talk about in the report. And then, of course, the stigma and discrimination that results as, um, as, um, as a result of any unethical practices. The best practices also talks about co-occurring and trauma-informed approaches. Um, for your information, in case you don't know, we have a new practice guide for implement, implementing trauma-informed approach, which is available on our website. Um, and you know, while many recovery houses may be specific to substance use disorder, many folks that live in recovery houses also have a co-occurring disorder. And we really encourage that leadership and staff reflect um, both co-occurring and trauma-informed approaches within their policies and procedures. Uh, SAMHSA has a clear definition of recovery houses, which are safe, healthy, family-like, substance-free living environments that support uh, individuals in recovery. And while recovery residences may vary widely in structure, um, most of them are centered around peer connection and the availability of support services that promote and sustain long-term recovery. Uh, the, the best practices also talk about having established policies and procedures to ensure that the residents' rights are outlined to include freedom from abuse and neglect, maybe from forced or co coerced labor, the privacy of their physical health and behavioral health records, uh, the freedom to manage their own finances, have family supports, and again, freedom from unethical patient brokers. And most importantly, um, I think there should be a process. Well, we recommend that there should be a process to submit and resolve grievances, as well as the ability for individuals to understand that process. So, you know, not only providing people with this detailed form of what their, their uh, grievance process is, but that they understand that once they move into the recovery residence. We, one of the best practices we highlight is certification of recovery houses to ensure that it meets organizational, fiscal, and um, operational standards. Um, and then we also talk about the misuse of medications and how that uh, may have uh, detrimental effects on both the individual and other residents, and that there be some policy around that. Um, since most recovery houses do not have direct support staff, a diversion risk management can look different across recovery houses and levels of support. The recovery housing re best practices report um, also can really help uh, assist the field in gauging the effectiveness of services that are provided and also enable recovery houses to utilize the data to support requests for data for state and federal funding. And one of the other things that we talk about is the um, opportunity perhaps to have resident satisfaction surveys where, you know, that really is a valuable indicator when uh, the person that's living in the house can actually evaluate uh, the support that they get and, and can really help with the overall performance of the facility and then lead to program modification if necessary. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So in conclusion, I just want to talk about uh, very briefly our other recovery housing efforts um, here. You know, and as I said, SAMHSA strongly supports the use of recovery housing as a key recovery support strategy. Uh, along with our best practices document, we also have uh, the report for our recovery housing and housing first models meeting that we held the um, integration or intersection of recovery housing and housing first. Uh, which is under review right now, but will be available on our website very soon. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we are collaborating with other centers and offices within SAMHSA, the Office of Recovery, to really review and kind of coordinate all the work that's being done right now around recovery housing. And there is a lot of work that is being done. Um, and then we are going to be following up to have uh, and host a, an interagency work group to collaborate recovery housing and all the things that are happening across the federal government. So I wanna thank you all for the opportunity today for this really quick overview. Please go to our website um, and take a look at our document. 
best practices for recovery housing. Uh, and I will turn it back to Paulo. Thank you so much, Donna. Uh, our next very brief update is from our uh, esteemed deputy director, Michael Askew, on Recovery Month. Michael. Uh, thank you, Paulo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Recovery Month Exchange. Uh, celebrating recovery. Uh, we do that all year, but certainly September is National Recovery Month, uh, and we celebrate uh, the joys and triumphs of uh, recovery. Uh, we do that in a few ways, and certainly we promote it National Recovery Month through SAMHSA's uh, website. Uh, on the website, we have this year uh, the digital toolkit, uh, uh, some weekly blasts that we send out weekly, uh, some walk for recovery promotional materials. And also on the website was Dr. Duffer Redman's National Recovery Month video message, along with President Biden's uh, presidential proclamation for Recovery Month. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more in depth on each of these. Uh, next slide. So the toolkit, uh, which was really unique to have a lot of uh, traffic, uh, we had a lot of people uh, support us through uh, getting that toolkit out. Uh, but the toolkit was really one of those uh, pieces that really allowed people to come and get uh, a lot of the different type of, uh, you know, pieces that you can uh, display in honor of Recovery Month. Uh, we had key messages and weekly themes that we, we did at the Office of Recovery. Uh, there were social media shareables and people were downloading a lot. Uh, there were stickers, virtual backgrounds. We did email signatures along the way with uh, some infographics that can be downloaded both in English and Spanish, as well as uh, plenty of resources and posters and the toolkit was really, uh, really, um, you know, captured by a lot of uh, our national recovery, uh, you know, communities uh, to really place those um, those graphics out in their communities to celebrate their events and in, in different parts of their uh, opportunities to, to showcase recovery. Uh, next slide, please. So in the toolkit, uh, there was a, an impact that was made based on. Uh, people accessing the uh, uh, website. Uh, the toolkit was most uh, most directed through uh, organic search and email. So uh, a lot of people used their email uh, tag uh, that we supported uh, people to use to have people identify how to get to that page by clicking on the link. Uh, we also had the toolkit uh, was visited by the the, the most uh, was visit the section of the toolkit was visited by the most uh, in the in the National Recovery Month uh, landing page. Uh, also, the uh, recovery is possible. Uh, straightforward theme that we had uh, was our top asset that was uh, downloaded as well. Uh, recovery is possible for everyone was also uh, one of those most downloaded social media graphics uh, in week one as well as 274 total websites drove traffic to our landing page. So we want to thank all those websites out there that, you know, really promoted our uh, recovery month uh, through their organizations. Next slide. Some other data was uh, whenever you are, wherever you are, you can find recovery help and support. Uh, in week one uh, was most clicked uh, English social media posts. Uh, also, hey, I, Esperanza, La recuperation is possible. That means I hope uh, and uh, recovery is possible in Spanish uh, was the most clicked Spanish social media post. There's a lot of other posts that we placed uh, in the toolkit, uh, but the most clicked and downloadable assets were our infographics, recovery is possible, uh, animations and stickers and email signatures as well. Uh, and the top hashtags uh, were more general recovery uh, related uh, hashtag recovery, hashtag recovery month, and hashtag recovery as possible. Although there were 10 hashtags, re uh, hashtag recovery was the most used uh, hashtag. Uh, so when you have your events, feel free to use those and other hashtags. We appreciate your support there as well. Uh, next slide. So at the Office of Recovery, we have what we uh, deemed a National Week of Themes. Uh, 
Uh, and each week uh, from last from this year, we had uh, inclusion in week one. Uh, we had equity in week two, uh, wellness in week three, and peer support in week four. And throughout the week, we had not only from the Office of Recovery, but uh, our national partners and national uh, and, and community leaders and uh, community organizations support uh, our, 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 our being able to, to get out webinars and presentations uh, throughout the month. And so we had over 40 uh, presentation webinars on these topics of discussion. Uh, and we certainly had a great traffic of people coming in to uh, learn more about those topics as well. So uh, look forward to some more uh, topic discussion in the weeks ahead. And we'll certainly have uh, that on the website as well. Uh, next slide. And then finally, I uh, want to just mention uh, the recovery. Uh, Walk for Recovery that SAMHSA is going to be having uh, this next year in 2024 uh, in September. Uh, we also uh, look to have it at the National Mall in Washington, D.C., so it's going to be a bigger event. Uh, we had a walk this year. Uh, we walked from Union Station down to the reflective pool in front of the U.S. Capitol, uh, but this walk is going to be signified as a uh, in your face walk. We want to, as we know in recovery, uh, we want to share how recovery looks like. So we're going to have a voice and a, a face to recovery where people can actually see uh, recovery. Uh, it's going to be a family uh, oriented uh, event. Uh, we're, not, we're not sure what the date is, but still uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll certainly be happy to uh, have you come and join us. Uh, let, listen out for more information on that as well. Uh, and I think that's it for me. Uh, Paolo, back to you. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, moving quickly along here, we're going to turn to Lupe Mendez uh, on our team to talk about some of our updates online. Lupe. Hi, Paolo. Thank you. So my name is Lupe Mendez, and I work on the um, recovery website. So I wanted to announce today that the Office of Recovery has migrated to a new web page. Um, we will provide the link in the chat. Thank you, Grace. Um, some of the new features that are included in the web page are the our news and events, um, and as well as some um, recovery funding information. Um, so in our recovery news and events, um, this is an opportunity for all of our recovery stakeholders, anybody to sign up for our recovery webinars, um, as well as to read the latest recovery news. So any news that we publish um, will be shared here. Um, so highly encourage everybody to sign up for our recovery updates. Um, we will also be posting all of our future quarterly recovery exchange meetings here. So this is where you would go to sign up for our recovery exchange meetings. Um, and another great resource is um, we have listed all of our recovery resources on this webpage. Um, the resources include our TA centers, our materials and publications, as well as our webinar recording. So this recovery exchange webinar um, is being recorded and it will be published um, on this website here under webinars. Thank you, Paolo. Awesome, thank you so much, Lupe. Um, rounding up our presentations today is a focus on data and measures uh, and leading that uh, effort for us is our statistician, Grace Lee. Grace, please. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to see everyone here. Um, so this first slide is um, the 2022 NISDA report um, that Tom was presenting some of the recovery um, results for. So um, there's a QR code in which you can you know, click on it and takes you straight to the, the report. Um, we will also drop a link in the chat um, to the report as well. Um, next slide, please. So um, today we'll also be talking about um, the importance um, and the need for um, identifying unified and validated recovery measures. Um, so next slide, please. So it's really, it's of great importance that we um, identify some validated recovery measures um, for several reasons. Um, and as I think most of you know on the call, it's crucial to the early identification of substance use and mental health issues. And um, it's being able to identify um, some of these 
conditions earlier is crucial for timely interventions and preventions of further harm. Um, establishing the appropriate recovery measures also allow for um, the monitoring of individual progress um, to be able to assess treatment effectiveness and to also help tailor interventions um, that are specific to um, each individual's needs. And recovery measures also provide valuable data for informing policy decisions, allocating resources, and improving overall healthcare systems. Uh, next slide, please. However, um, there are several challenges um, that we face in identifying effective recovery measures. Um, firstly, there's a lack of consensus on what constitutes recovery. So here at CMSA, um, we define recovery as a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. However, um, different individuals um, will still will define recovery differently based on their own experiences and goals. And you can see that in the recovery research field too. Um, and this makes it difficult to identify and develop um, recovery measures. Um, there is also limited evidence base. Um, while there's a growing body of research on substance use and mental health recovery, there's still a lot that we don't know. And this can make it really difficult to identify exactly which recovery measures are most effective, um, especially when we're trying to uh, make sure that we're using um, measures that are appropriate across all age groups, across um, different socioeconomic um, statuses, across different racial ethnic groups, um, et cetera. Um, also due to the stigma and discrimination that is associated with substance use and mental health disorders, it can prevent individuals from seeking help and participating in recovery programs, which in turn also make it difficult to collect accurate data um, on recovery outcomes. Um, and lastly, um, balancing the need for comprehensive assessment with the burden on individuals and healthcare providers can also be challenging. Um, and I think a lot of, um, you on the call can attest that you know limited resources um, can. Um, there's a lot of limited resources, which makes it really difficult um, to you know provide treatment as well as collecting data um, from folks um, that you're trying to serve. Um, so yep, next okay, awesome. So here um, we have um, a a list of scales and measures that are currently. Um, available to measure recovery outcomes by using um, a lot of different constructs, including recovery capital, um, evaluation of services, quality of life, et cetera. However, not all of these scales have been validated, um, and those that are are um, only validated amongst specific subpopulations. And also a lot of scales are being used by a lot of different studies to measure different aspects um, of recovery. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, this will help um, kick us off um, to the open dialogue that we have um, scheduled for the rest of the meeting. But here's some questions um, to consider, um, and we love to get your thoughts on these as well um, when choosing appropriate recovery measures. So, um, you know, what types of measures um, that um, you think um, would align with specific needs and goals of the individuals being assessed? Um, how do we employ tools that are culturally sensitive and age appropriate and accessible to diverse populations? And how do we also um, combine quantitative and qualitative measures to capture a holistic view um, of recovery progress? Um, and yeah, and I'll hand it over to Paulo. Thank you, Grayson, uh, uh, for your presentation. And again, there's questions. We'd love to get feedback from folks as we begin this work looking at recovery measures. I see there's a number of good um, suggestions here in the chat as well that we'll follow up on. Uh, just to conclude, as we look to year two for the Office of Recovery, just to highlight 
three things real quickly that we have in our plans. The first is we recently launched something called SPARC. SPARC stands for SAMHSA Programs to Advance Recovery Knowledge. And uh, this is a new technical assistance effort to look at ways of advancing recovery across the nation. It will include um, work, for instance, updating recovery-oriented systems of care as just one of the products and efforts um, that we are um, using that particular vehicle for. So a lot more to come, a lot more work to come through Spark um, in the months to come. The second is we are looking at doing additional convenings of meetings. Uh, we did a whole series, as we noted uh, this past year, including a tribal recovery summit meeting. This year, we have several that we're looking at doing on peer crisis respite programs, employment, peer workforce, and others. Last thing I'll note, just on a really excited about this as well, in conjunction with our recovery month efforts, and that's an arts focused activity. And uh, that will be a gallery of recovery as we're framing it, and an opportunity for people from across the country to share their creative talents. Um, in terms of depicting recovery from mental health and addiction issues. So a lot more to come on all of those uh, particular exciting work. But now here's your opportunity in the time that we have remaining um, to uh, provide us some feedback. Again, we're uh, interested in uh, you know, any questions or thoughts you have about what we shared here, what more is needed. Um, and um, uh, also to hear what you're doing in the local and state levels. Um, so we'll go to folks who raised their hands here, first of all. And uh, starting with Dina, had her hand up for quite some time. Dina. Dina, are you with us still? Maybe you should come back around. So let's go to Jason. Hi, everybody. Jason Robison with SHARE in Los Angeles, and thank you, everybody at the Office of Recovery. Uh, welcome, Katera. Uh, as somebody who has worked with Katera in California, you really have a treasure, and I really think that Katera is going to help all of our efforts. So kudos on a great selection. Uh, I, I And I also want to uh, just acknowledge and appreciate the work of the Office of Recovery uh, going full steam ahead. The, the focus on data has been very helpful for us. We use the percentages of people with substance use and mental health issues who define themselves as people in recovery on a regular basis. And it really helps shift the focus in California back to a recovery-oriented focus People might know that in California, we have some troublesome, coercive kind of things going on with substance use and homelessness, and that data is very helpful. I also want to say great job and thank you with the recovery residences best practices uh, in Los Angeles. We're looking at uh, scaling a model of recovery residences for people who've experienced homelessness and mental health issues. And this is very helpful to help us standardize and uh, quantify how we do that. So thank you. And I also, last thing, I'll shut up. We are honoring Paolo at the Share Recovery Awards dinner on January 21st. And we're gonna be putting that out to all of you so you can put it out and make sure that the work of this great office is uplifted. So thank you all for your work. Thank you, Jason. I'm honored to be recognized and look forward to the event next month. Um, you know, one of the other things I neglected to mention either is harm reduction and recovery. And so um, that is also going to be a particular focus in our office um, in the coming year, including a, a meeting particularly focused on that intersection. Skip, I know you're going to Talk about justice involved. Oh, hi, Paolo. Yes, of course I am. You know me very well. Yes. Hello, everybody. Skip, um, Executive Director of the New York City Justice Peer Initiative. Forgive me for coming in late. I was busy preparing for my first big justice peer training class. But yes, tell me, 
Hi, Olo. How we're looking at those who are justice impacted in the coming year? As you know, we convened a meeting this past summer that included you and others that looked at mm -hmm. um, justice and, and recovery. And, you know, the huge expansion, I'll say, around peer support workers in the justice involved system. And, you know, just to cite mm -hmm. my rounds, had an opportunity, uh, you know, to visit a number of states this past um, this past year and hearing the work, for instance, in Pennsylvania, where they have 6,000 people, I understand it, working in jails and prisons, work efforts in Ohio, where they have people, prisoners that are hired to be, provide peer support specialists, you know, in the prisons and then taking those skills when they get released. Um, you know, we, we really do need to highlight more and more of those kind of works as just, uh, you know, a couple of examples. So we look forward to getting the summary of the meeting out um, from this summer and then building on that. And I know, Skip, you will keep us true and honest to that. So thank you for your leadership. Definitely appreciate you much. Congratulations on your award. Thank you. Harvey. Hi, folks. Harvey Rosenthal, Alliance for um, Rights and Recovery. I, I, I'm struck by the focus on data. I so applaud it. I would say in the country, most payers, states and managed care companies, Medicaid, the data they're looking for is decreased hospitalization. But what we care about is what people are doing when they're not in hospital. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with social determinants of health. And you know, so the data around housing, stable housing, loved housing first, we'd love to see more of that actually real uh, employment uh, and social connection. You know, The Surgeon General talks a lot about loneliness uh, so to me, that that pushes, that suggests that SAMHSA should be doing a lot more with HUD and Department of Justice, also in terms of of, uh, of reductions in incarceration and 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 uh, contact with police. So the collaborations, and I know we've talked about this a lot, but the more SAMHSA can do with HUD, with Department of Labor, with Department of Justice, and finally with the Center for Medicaid and uh, and Medicare services because they set the outcomes for the Medicaid program. Uh, and that's where most of the money goes in the country. So, you know, to the extent that we can get states to feel they are, are required through Medicaid to get people access to housing and employment in some fashion, that'd be really great. So anything you can do there, that would be great. Okay, thank you, Harvey. And couldn't agree more in terms of federal partnerships are critical uh, work. Uh, Donna mentioned about... Uh, this uh, new federal interagency work group on recovery housing that we're gonna launch in the coming year with HUD and, uh, and other federal agencies as well is just one example of that, but thank you for that. Lori, Laura Mitchell. Hi, yes, we are all working very hard and doing a lot of amazing work, right? Um, but many times we don't know what everyone else is doing. We're trying to solve a problem that someone else is already addressing or has already come up with a, a reasonable solution for. What I'd love to see from your office is um, like a catalog of materials, of videos explaining the programs that others have come up with. For right now, I'm searching for options for students in school. We're seeing horrendous spikes for our students. Um, when they're caught with or under the influence of a substance, they're expelled or suspended disconnected from what little bit of connection they still had, usually with no harm reduction tools. And it's it's a deadly recipe. So I'm looking for how other people are solving that. And this seems like a great place for that repository. Excellent uh, idea. We'll, we'll take that up with our new Spark effort. Um, and we also, I should note, uh, fund other technical assistance efforts. So we have Matthew Federici here with the Copeland Center. We have Tim Saubers with the Peer Recovery Center of Excellence, both who are in line here to have some comments. So maybe they can add to this as well, but uh, I'm gonna start here with Raquel Fetzer. Raquel, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for your leadership as well. And congratulations on your upcoming award. Um, I just wanted to, um, again, say thank you for this platform um, for everyone across the country. And I also wanted to mention that good things do happen in Philadelphia. And I represent the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services for the city of Philadelphia. And we really do have some innovative work that's happening and also in the last year and that's coming down the pipeline. 
So I would love to see some of this work from my colleagues um, and my teams highlight it in this space if possible. Um, for example, one uh, project that we have that has been um, very effective in dealing with the xylazine crisis is we have the state's, uh, one of our providers is over this, but it's the state's first medically licensed mobile wound care van. Um, and they, this is, um, so this is uh, paid for through the opioid settlement funds. And it is also uh, ran by one of our providers in conjunction with TDH IDS. And they can also do assessments for folks on the um, van in case they decide that they do want to go into treatment or they can, you know, connect them to peer specialists or connect them to, um, you know, housing, shelter services. So that's pretty exciting. We actually now um, have a second van that just started going out and that's been accompanying our homeless outreach teams. So it's been pretty exciting stuff that it, they've been helping out with, um, you know, like challenges that we're seeing with xylazine, folks having xylazine wounds in the unsheltered population, not only in Kensington, but citywide. So I would love to like see some of that work highlighted and also some pretty innovative um, housing model solutions that we're putting together, such as like couples housing, um, which is, you know, couple shelter, because we've been seeing, you know, on the streets that folks don't necessarily want to come in somewhere unless their significant other can come. And we know about, you know, five years ago, that was unheard of. So it's pretty exciting that this is that, you know, we're meeting people where they're at. So thank you all for your leadership and your efforts. Um, I'm also a person in long-term recovery. Um, so I, I really value this work. It, it's personal and professional for me. Thank you so much for sharing that, Raquel. And as a Philadelphian myself, even though I'm 30 years in DC, Philly's my heart. Tim Saubers, please. Hi, my name is Tim Saubers. Um, as was mentioned, I do work for the Peer Recovery Center of Excellence, but um, this, this one time, <laughs> I'm actually here representing the National Association of Peer Supporters, um, uh, which I'm the Vice President of the Board, so I'm not speaking in my paid position um, or in any way connected to the Center of Excellence right now. Um, but to your kind of question about measuring data and outcomes, um, what I would love to see is, is just a recentering on, on kind of actually recovery and peer values. Um, where we really struggle is, I think, even the data that we use right now to justify a lot of specifically peer support services. While the studies were done in the way that they were done for a variety of reasons, they are still really focused on did peer support lead to a reduction in substance use? Did it increase abstinence? Did it decrease engagement with services? Did it increase compliance with treatment plans? And none of those things are really relevant peer outcomes. Um, and particularly for the way that you're talking about how do we measure recovery moving forward, they're really not relevant recovery outcomes either. Um, and so when I think about even like what what the base from which everything is built needs to be re-examined um, so that we can really recenter the recovery values that you guys are talking about. You know, I do appreciate the SAMHSA recovery definition that has nothing to do with sobriety or taking meds or reduction in symptoms. And, and I think that message gets lost. Um, I think we see a lot of misinformation in peer certification trainings, which really focus on integration into systems, oftentimes at the cost of a, a true understanding of what peer support is and could be. Um, and so when I even look at the models that were that were put up as examples earlier, with maybe some, some pretty severe adaptations, they could be useful. Um, but even to use the recovery capital model as an example, I've had that questionnaire asked to me as a person who previously used substances in a way that caused harm and, and I no longer do. And for me, the recovery capital assessment is still very, very centered in abstinence. It asks a lot of questions that are very relevant to have you participated in 12-step programming or not, even though it uses different language. Um, and so I think that there just needs to be a base acknowledgement that a lot of the tools that we're using right now are uh, really not appropriate for peer services or more broadly recovery-oriented services, and that there needs to be an expansion of what we're considering to be effective models, right? There was a lot of talk about, is it, has it been verified? Is it evidence-based? And I know there's a big push for more practice-based evidence. And I really believe that that's the direction we need to go. I think trying to fit peer support as, as a, a, you know, it's, it was like putting a square peg in a round hole, right? The more that you try to push peer and recovery me uh, outcome measurements through this lens of is it verified, is it evidence-based, the further we get from being able to actually measure those things. And so I believe there needs to be kind of new processes to vet and determine what we're considering 
really functional measurements uh, and tools that we're using. Um, thanks. Great, great comments, Tim. Thank you so much. I know Matthew uh, agrees because you put in some comments here in the chat about importance of uh, measuring empowerment and hope and things of that nature. Matthew, you're up. Um, thanks, Paulo. And uh, yeah, I'd be remiss not to say congratulations on um, having a, a new spectacular addition, Katera, there at your team. Um, and uh, again, just thank you. The, uh, the indication of the number of people with lived experience and peers involved today and the formation of the Office of Recovery is something that we, I think, despite all of our day-to-day -day challenges, we have to note uh, is huge progress from 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and that that's wonderful when we have this platform. I, I think what I would really like to share or take the opportunity here to say on this platform with compliments what Tim was saying. Um, and, you know, I think at the cornerstone of all of this is that we need to shift the paradigm where we're talking about treatment assisting recovery, not recovery assisted treatment. Um, and that is a huge paradigm shift. Um, I just want to reflect that a huge shift towards systems reform. I think the peer movement is one huge shift, but I think we're now like in the, our foot is in the door and we're able to speak to the elephant in the room. And that is while our system is still defining uh, our experiences and recovery around the DSM, which I do believe verifiably lacks validity and reliability, um, you know, it's not recovery oriented. Uh, and it directs the way we see outcomes and data, like Tim was just saying. Um, however, I recognize we do need something you know, in place to determine uh, priority groups, medical necessity criteria. And there is an instrument, which is the World Health Organization's Independent Classification of Functioning Disability and Disease. And that, that model takes the biological factors as just one factor and allows us to assess and measure social determinants. Um, and it does exist and it's being used around the world. Um, I wanna acknowledge that it's a challenge because that takes a coordination between federal and state level. Uh, but I do think all of us collectively, if we take a look at that and start to speak up and advocate, um, I, I do think if the states were to take it on, CMS would seriously look at changing the DSM as being the basis of all that. And I think it is the cornerstone of what keeps us stuck where we all know and see and talk about recovery, but everything is still symptom pathology based. Uh, and then my last comment is that I think a really big bridge and I see the Office of Recovery helping us overcome a huge gap, which is traditional structures of services have defined our addiction recovery path and our mental health recovery path as separate when we all know they're not. Um, and until we break down those barriers, which I see the office is trying to break them down here, uh, and get us to work together. At the agency level and the state funding level, the funding and the agencies have to be one, one place, not two separate programs on two different tracks because that's where we get separated from each other. At the heart of both the research for both of us is connection and belonging. Uh, connection and belonging, I believe, are critical aspects of what sets us on a path of mental health difficulties and, uh, and substance use. Uh, and just really wanna echo what I'm hearing over and over again from communities that are mixed communities of uh, addiction, mental health co-occurring is connection and belonging. Thank you for the opportunity to, to be on this platform. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, uh, appreciate your comments. Uh, just make one uh, note about measurement, why I believe it's really important that we identify a really recovery focused measure is with the push towards value-based purchasing across healthcare and within mental health and addictions care as well. Um, there's a real need for us to identify recovery measures because you know the dollar really does determine much of um, the approaches that get funded, right? And get supported. So um, it's really critical. Christina, please. All right, so good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're at. And Paulo, I've seen you multiple places, but never got a chance to meet you. So how are you doing? <laughs> and Katera, I, I live in uh, California, so I'm shocked that we have never met yet, okay? And what's up, Kristen and everybody else, Michael? I just wanna applaud efforts you know, for the uh, for SAMHSA number one. Uh, I was able to attend uh, that summit that you were speaking of at the 988 summit out in Oklahoma. And so the different tribes that came, and I just wanna say that's awesome to see that because I'm Apache and Cherokee in that Cherokee Nation area. So to be able to have SAMHSA's representation, especially 
the, the top dog be there along with a group of individuals to see that representation as we were doing gore dancing, we were doing traditional stuff that we know that's needed, not just in Western medicine and like therapy and there's different stuff that we do, but the other things that we do, you know, traditionally. So to see SAMHSA at the table uh, and visiting some of the grant holders in Oklahoma was amazing. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, um, I just uh, wanted to say too, on the flip side of things, and um, I know uh, Skip does a lot with the criminal justice, but I do a lot with the LGBT uh, uh, community. And in doing so, my question is to, or comment or ask is like for the Office of Recovery, what are we doing not only just about sexual orientation and it, as it weaves into recovery and being our authentic self, but also the gender piece, because we're getting a lot of pushbacks in different states that is very derogatory that we have the youth that are killing themselves, that are going into mental health, that are utilizing the 988 lines and also applauding y'all for the 25 and younger uh, that I, I see that, you know, if you're LGBT specific, you know, or you're native, you know, they've got specific extra funding, but what are we doing at the Office of Recovery? I understand at SAMHSA there is a area that there is for LGBT, but there's also the recovery as we talk about recovery homes, recovery residences, recovery facilities that we can do better with, you know, not only just, okay, we have the sexual orientation piece, but also the gender piece that is missed, which was our, you know, intersex folks, just the different people, trans folks, gender fluid. And if we haven't got there yet, uh, what can we do? And what, do you, what is SAMHSA looking at to improve or be a part of, shall I say? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much for uh, all those comments and questions. Um, one of the, the areas SAMHSA, a couple areas in SAMHSA on LGBTQI plus is working on, um, one is a national summit as well this coming year. Um, so stay tuned for that. In conjunction with that, um, we're looking at uh, convening a recovery focused LGBTQI meeting um, as well. So more to come about that. The other areas across government and SAMHSA has certainly been leading the way here is uh, looking at measurement as well, including um, trans and others in terms of how we are capturing data um, in just to name a, a couple of areas. We do have a center of excellence that's focused on LGBTQI plus. If you're not familiar with that, we can send that out to folks um, as well. The other thing I wanna note just your the first comments, the importance about um, indigenous healing practices mm -hmm. and um, through the SPARC uh, initiative that I mentioned, and Michael Askew here will be helping to lead this as well, um, is the development of a compendium of recovery-based healing practices that have emerged from various communities that's practice-based evidence, kind of things that you're, you're describing. So I look forward to to that, Christina, and working more with you on, on all these efforts. Well, awesome. Thank you, Paolo. And thank you, everybody. And thank you, Samsa. We are at the end of our time. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining um, here today. I want to give a special shout out to the entire Office of Recovery team. We just have an amazing group of, feet, of folks here. Special shout out to Lupe Mendez, because Lupe does all the background work in helping to get folks uh, together here and all the logistics. Lastly, thank you all for the work you do, uh, where it really is, is so important and wish everyone happy holidays and a, a wonderful new year. Thank you all for joining.